Paul, the author of Romans here, he was a radical. He set the world on fire back in the day. And if we read him closely, he will set our lives on fire today. One of the most radical concepts that he put forth was that we are justified by grace through faith. Now, as I finish this series, I want to talk about what that means and why that is so radical. But first, the news. Now, I know you tune into church to hear good news. And you might not want to be reminded of all the depressing headlines of the week. And right now they are particularly depressing. But there's a news story that I think can lead us into understanding what it means justified by grace through faith. And that news story is the resignation of Jerry Falwell Jr. as the head of Liberty University. Now, Falwell Jr. is the oldest son of the famous Jerry Falwell, who started Liberty University. And he resigned this week after two incidents that were sexual in nature. Now, if you're not tuned into the news of Christian higher education, then you might not know that the problems that led up to the resignation have been brewing for a while. There have been several incidents of erratic leadership, of financial mismanagement, and general misconduct. Christian colleges are different from secular universities in that they seek not only to develop the intellectual skills of their students, but they focus on forming the affections. That is to say, that because we are strongly motivated by what we love, Christian institutions, including the church, help guide us by making sure that the things that we love are ordered beneath our ultimate love of God. And that's a quote from a woman named Caitlin Schleiss. Um, she attended Liberty University. Let me say that again. Um, Christian institutions help guide us by, quote, making sure that the things that we love are ordered beneath our ultimate love of God. In other words, and I believe Paul is making this case, whatever comes before God in our affections will corrupt us. Now, I'm in no position to judge Jerry Falwell Jr. I have no interest in that. But it is clear by his behavior, and, and as we can see in the behavior of other people as well, that certain affections came before his love of God. And when sin makes its way into our lives through one avenue, it doesn't remain in that one area. It moves into every other arena of life. And the tragedy of Falwell's sin is that it moved through his life and then through him corrupted an institution that was entrusted with shaping the faith of many, many young people. Now, I have no doubt that Liberty University will be restored. There are a lot of good people there. And it is my prayer also that Jerry Falwell will be restored. Whenever a nationally recognized Christian leader is publicly disgraced in that way, the people who trusted in him or her then have to ask the question of what role grace plays in the matter. To what degree are Christian victims required to balance accountability with grace? And when we think of extending grace and forgiveness to someone, it can feel like we're letting something slide. Grace then becomes a kind of get-out-of-jail-free card. And when the person who was extended grace is not really repentant, then the value of grace itself is brought into question. Jimmy Swaggart offers us a good example of that. 
Jimmy Swaggart is a well-known televangelist who was also involved in a scandal. The first time he got into trouble was in 1988 when he got caught with some prostitutes. And he publicly repented of his sin in a very dramatic way. He asked for forgiveness of his congregation and of God, and as tears streamed down his face, he called out, I have sinned against you, my Lord, and I would ask that your precious blood would wash and cleanse every stain until it is in the seas of God's forgetfulness. He was forgiven, and he was restored to his ministry. But in 1991, he was caught in the same situation again. He was pulled over in Indio, California by a police officer for driving on the wrong side of the road. He was under the influence um, of alcohol, and he had, of course, a prostitute in the car with him. But when he was confronted with his sin this time, instead of confession... His response was, the Lord told me that it is flat none of your business. Sometimes it seems as if grace is what fools extend to the undeserving. But this isn't a good example of grace. God is no fool. God did not give us a get-out-of-jail-free get card and then hope that we would behave better the next time. A better example of grace can be seen in Luke chapter 5. Uh, in Luke chapter 5, in the beginning, uh, Simon, Peter, and his, uh, and his crew on his ship have been out fishing all night long, and they've caught nothing. And so they bring their ship uh, to shore, and they've got it by the edge of the water. And as they're there, Jesus comes walking by. And, of course, there's a bunch of people following Jesus, wanting to hear from him some, uh, the word of God. And so Jesus says to Simon Peter, let's get in your boat and, and take me out a little bit so that I can speak to the people. And so Jesus gets out, and he preaches to the people on the shore. And when he's done, he sits down, and he says to Simon Peter, Go out a little further now and put your nets out in the, in the water. And Simon Peter says, Lord, we've already done that. We've been fishing all night long and we haven't caught anything. The fish are just not out there today. But if you say so, we'll do it. So, of course, he puts the net over the boat. And what happens? Tons of fish. There's so many fish that they have to call for help to have the nets pulled into the boat. And then they pull the nets in the boat and the fish are just overflowing and they start to sink the boat. So they have to bring another boat and they start putting the fish in the other boat and it starts to sink that boat. There's so many fish. And Simon Peter is overwhelmed where he expected nothing. There was abundance. And Simon Peter his response to this is he falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Another way of putting it is that he said, master, leave. I am a sinner and I can't handle this holiness. We don't ask for grace we are struck by it. Grace is God's perfect love, and perfect love illuminates our sins in such a way that it becomes hard to endure. Simon Peter witnessed God's love in Jesus, and it made everything in his life look shameful in comparison. Grace is not a release. It is a conviction. God's grace is anything but a release. It is a structure that reshapes our lives. It transforms us from being broken people into a reflection of God's love here in the world. When we see God's perfect love, we automatically want to be better people 
We want to be a part of it. And we are willing to do the hard work then of following Jesus. And this is what it means to be justified by grace through faith. It means to be transformed back into what God created us to be through the experience of God's perfect love, which illuminates all that is in us that is not of God. And when this happens, we sacrifice our whole lives to God, trusting that all that is not God will be burned away, and what is left will be who we are in Christ. So what does that look like on a practical level? Well, that's exactly what this reading is about today. So let's go back and look at it line by line to see what Paul is really saying to us. It says, when we have been struck by grace and decide that we want to change and become something greater, we want our love to be genuine. Love is not a facade that we wear to impress or to convince. It is pure and deeply rooted in our lives. We are repulsed by evil, corruption, disorder, violence, hostility. As they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, we recoil from it as if from a hot flame. We hold tight to what is good because we value it above all else. In our communities, when they're filled with grace, we love one another with mutual affection. We are not concerned with the honors that are bestowed on us, but we are seeking for ways to show honor to others. We are all in. We don't hold back. We are zealous and ardent in our desire to serve God. Whenever and wherever we see signs of hope, we rejoice. We meet difficulty with patience, not impatience. We pray continually. We share our resources with those who are in need. We reach out to strangers with hospitality. Now, here's where it starts to get really hard. Paul says that when we're transformed by a confrontation with grace, we often become people who bless those who persecute us. Now, think about how often we like to complain about the harm that other people do us or to our interests. It has become a national pastime in this country to demean and dehumanize the other side. When grace is present, our complaints, our cynicism, our contempt for others starts to sound like nails on a chalkboard. It becomes such an unpleasant sound to our own ears that we start to practice trying to tune our voices to make the sounds of blessings and not curses. When grace is present, we do not shut people out. When they are happy, we're happy for them. When they weep, we weep with them. We live in harmony. We are not haughty. We spend our time with the poor and with those who are rejected, who don't fit in. We don't claim to be smarter or wiser than we are. We do not justify our own evil acts by saying that somebody else deserved it. We know that the noble gesture is only truly noble if it is offered under all circumstances and not just when we're being watched or when somebody is worthy of it. We go out of our way to seek peace among people. We go the extra mile placing our pride beneath the well-beings of others. Now, as we start to take on the qualities that are listed here in verses 9 through 18, we begin to embody grace itself. We start to show glimpses of God's perfect love. And as we do this more and more, we begin to stand out in the world. 
When somebody embodies these qualities of grace, we notice them. They have an impact on our lives. The title that's been given to this passage is called The Marks of the True Christian. And it's hard to be around a true Christian and not feel compelled to change our ways. I think that's what Paul is getting to in these last verses, verses 19 through 21. At first glance, it seems as if underneath it all, Paul's exhortation that we should be kind to our enemies is really just a desire to best them. And in some ways it is. He says, never avenge yourselves, but leave vengeance to God. But God's vengeance is redemptive and not punitive. No, Paul says, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Show your enemies God's perfect love. The power of God's perfect love reveals the pain of sin. And so when we expose our enemies or our friends to God's perfect love through our own acts of redemptive love, their sin becomes like burning coals on their heads. That's what Peter was feeling in that boat. In this way, they are transformed just as we are. We are not overcome by evil, but we overcome evil with good. The other news this week was the clashes between protesters and counter-protesters. Two people were killed in Wisconsin this past week, and last night another person was killed in Portland. And as we get closer to the election, the instability will rise, and so will the tensions, and sadly, incidents of violence will continue. And it's moments like this that we need grace. Not grace as a get-out-of-jail-free card, but the kind of grace that heaps burning coals on all of our heads. We need the transformative power of God's perfect love to convict to convict us of our own sin so that we may move forward towards something different. May that grace be first born here among us. Now, in this place. Amen. <laughs>